Esther, the book of Esther. We're going to be dealing with the book of Esther. Uh, we, we, this is, I think we've had, uh, we, we did an introduction last week. And I gave you the outline, and I'm going to probably stick kind of close to that outline. So if I gave you the outline, you see the similarities. It's going to be a little bit more, I'm adding more to it. Uh, but anyway, in chapter 1, we're going to see a drunken political party in which the king of Persia makes a demand, a command on his wife, the queen, Vashti. It's actually pronounced Vashti if it's it phonically, but we say Vashti, so I'm going to call her Vashti. Uh, she, must have, uh, she must have found that command degrading, demeaning. Uh, anyway, she was very offended by it, and she declined. She refused to listen. So we're going to see in the first chapter the refusal. So it's going to be the refusal in Esther. And uh, she refuses to obey the king's command. She stood for what was right, but it cost her dearly. Yes. It cost her everything. She's the one that winds up getting punished, not the one making the unjust command. Don't that sound like today? I mean, it's almost like today, if you try to do right, you're the one that loses your job. And the boss man that tried to get you to do wrong gets promoted. <laughs> That's the way it is today. Uh, that just shows you the, the world likes its own. They're not going to like us. They're not going to like us, so we shouldn't expect that. But she stood for what was right, willing to pay the cost, even though it was dearly. And uh, the big picture, though, is just realizing and remembering that God uses this injustice for His good. He uses this to place Esther where she needed to be, there by the king's side. So the Lord is in control even though it does not look like it. Even though it don't look right, the, the just being punished, God used that to put someone in position that's later going to save his people. So, so God's, in, God's in control. But we'll see it as we go. But first of all, in, in your outline, the party. Let's look at the party. That's going to be verses 1 through 9. And it came to pass in, those, in the days of Ahasuerus, this is Ahasuerus which reigned from India even to Ethiopia over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. A hundred and twenty-seven provinces. I told you how big an area that was last time. I named off all those countries, Syria, Turkey, all those countries, part of Russia and all that, the monopoly of the Middle East and even part of Russia was under his control. That in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace. Now, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the providence being before him. Now, under the party, I'm going to note several things uh, about this party, about this feast. And uh, you just jot them down, and, and uh, it may help you. But first of all, the first thing about the party is the promoter. Who's promoting this party? Who's behind this party? Who's throwing this bash? Well, Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus. Now, most scholars, most scholars and historians, got one loose. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, Mama's red face is worth it all. <laughs> I had uh, I had my my oldest one did that one time in the store. Notice I said one time. Because when I caught her, she did not want to run no more. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I, had to go, I had to leave without buying anything because people were looking at me so bad because I actually spanked a child. 
Yeah. I spanked her in public. I get you locked up nowadays. Yep. Amen. But I spanked her because that's when she'd done it. But anyway, uh, notice this. The promoter. The promoter was King Ahasuerus. Now, Ahasuerus, remember this. I didn't realize this till several years ago when we was in Daniel. But uh, Ahasuerus is a title much like Pharaoh, Caesar, President. Many historians and scholars believe that this Ahasuerus here is none other than Xerxes, King Xerxes. And his son, Artaxerxes, is the one who allowed Nehemiah to go back and build the wall. So we're in that time period, but Ahasuerus here, he, he, he reigned for 21 years, somewhere between 486 and and 465 B.C. He was assassinated and one of the attempts was foiled by Mordecai. And he gets rewarded for that later. But we'll, but I'm just telling you about that one who promoted here was King Ahasuerus. And he was believed to be Xerxes. His father and himself uh, are remembered for their invasion of Greece, which failed. They invaded Greece, and they wanted more. Had 127 providences, but was greedy and hungry for more. Some people can't be content where they are. Uh, now, I know there's nothing wrong with uh, trying to better yourself or do better, but sometimes it gets to a point to where it's just greed. You know what I mean? 127 providences. How much more power did he want? How much more power did he need? And we're going to see here in just a couple minutes that he didn't need money. He had plenty of that. You'll see that because he spent millions upon millions of dollars for this party. There was a lot of money that was spent on this party. But anyway, let's look at the purpose now. The promoter was a hazardous. Now, what was the purpose? The purpose, look at verse 3. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast to all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty, many days, even a hundred and four score days. Now, a score is 20. Four score is four times 20. That would be 180 days. That's half a year on a Jewish calendar. Half a year. Now that's a feast. That's a party. When you can throw a party and, and, and feed and, and give them drink and take care of everybody's needs for a half a year, that's a pretty powerful party, ain't it? Yeah. I mean, that's a party. But, but notice who was there. All the leaders. This was a political party. This party had a purpose. All the whining and dining uh, had a reason. How many of you ever heard there's no such thing as a free lunch? You ought to remember that. Somebody's whining and dining just because they want something out of you. He's wanting to invade Greece. Historians and history shows us that's what's going on during this time. Because it's also recorded, this, this bash, if you would, is also recorded in, in secular history. And they portray it as it is a political party. And in this party, he's trying to win the favor of his nobles and the princes and get them to support his attack on Greece. So he's whining and dining them for their support. Sounds familiar, don't it? Much like politicians do today. Uh, uh, but here's what's really interesting to me. You can read history and you can see what's going on. And, and you can read history and see how Xerxes goes in and he's, he's a fighting with Spartans. And the Spartans, man, 300 of them man out smart if they get in the past where it's kind of hemmed in. And they, for a whole day, withstand the most powerful army on the face of the earth. 300 men, take them on and and just stand them up, buddy. They have nothing they can do. I mean, they're just 
they're just outsmarted. And, but see, none of that matters to God. God didn't care about any of that. You know what God was talking about? A rebellious wife. How she refused to go in before the king. That's what he's focusing on. How that she's going to be replaced by another. Not, not a war. Not something that, you know, something big in our eyes. No, he's focusing in on the little things. There's a lesson that he wants us to get more important than whether the uh, Athens stands or falls or Sparta stands or falls. More important things were at play in his eyes. But look at the pride in verse 4. And he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom. He, he was showing off his wealth. He was trying to show and impress his guests, convince them that he could afford this war and get their support, get them behind him, and uh, help him fight this war so he could have more land, more power, more prestige. But that was his pride. Then notice verse 5, there's a pri the private, there's a private party. Look at this. And when these days were expired, what days? The 180 days. The king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace. Now, he's making another party. Right after that one ended, he has another one that lasts a week just for those that are in the palace. Here's probably where he's really rubbing elbows with the, with the important guys, okay? Uh, both into the great and the small, even, excuse me, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Now, pretty much, that's really needs commented on there. But, but So let's look at the next. Uh, in verse 6, we're going to see number 5 in your outline, the peacocking. He's really strutting it out now. He's really showing it off. How many of you have ever seen a peacock? You know what I'm saying when I say peacocking? I mean, he's really showing out. He's got it all on display. Look at verse 6. Where were white, green, blue, and blue hangings fashioned with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. And they gave them drink and vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance, according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law, none did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his, of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. So, so here, you see Peacock and... Uh, it mentioned the fine linens, the blues and the purples, and hanging on uh, with fine, fine, what was the word they used there? Fine linen. Uh, now, most ladies can tell you, linen's expensive. If you get some nice linen and stuff, you could spend some money. Linen's very expensive, and, and, and the, the colored the fine linen, it wouldn't be able to be mass produced like it is now. So if you had some beautiful colors, somebody spent some time on it, it would have been valuable. It would have been valuable. So we're talking about a lot of money, but not only the linens, but that hung on silver rings off of pillars of marble. How I many of you got a marble countertop? You don't have to raise your hand, but it's very expensive. It's very thin. And it's very expensive. Imagine pillars of marble. What that would cost. And those pillars' purpose was just to hold up this fine linen. Then it talked about uh, uh, their beds of gold. Now, we would call them day beds because back then when they would eat, they would lay on their side and they would eat like that. We sit at the table, we sit upright, and we face each other, sit beside each other, and that kind of stuff. But they would lay, and they would have like big patio areas where they would just have beds set up, or day beds where people could stretch out. They were made of gold 
and silver. And the patio wasn't your paper bricks. It was of colored marble. Very expensive. Very nice. Then in verse 6, they talked about the fine wines. They could drink of the king's wines, basically the fine wines. He was holding nothing back. He was, he was giving them all that they wanted. None was compelled to drink, but all could have all that they wanted. And they were served in vessels and cups of gold. And each cup differed from another. They were handmade. It wasn't that mass-made China knockoff junk. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> These were handcrafted, handmade, all differing, made of gold. Expensive. Expensive. He's really, he, he's pulling out all the stops, as they'd say. He's really trying to impress them. And uh, they could have all that they pleased. And then there's one more thing, the partner. The king has a partner here, uh, the queen, Vashti. Look at verse 9. Also, Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to the king Ahasuerus. Now, this is a separate house and a separate party. While the party is going on for the for the for the noblemen and the kings entertaining them, their wives are being entertained by the queen and their own place in another house. That was custom of their day. They did that. That was a normal custom that they would separate them like that. Uh, millions of dollars would have been spent on this party, this feast, if you would. Uh, makes me wonder how much money is spent by our Democratic conventions, our Republican conventions. I wonder how much money is actually spent on all these dinners. Now, I know that they use them to bring money in, and it's probably donor money, not necessarily taxpayer money. It's donor money. But I wonder how much money is spent on these when they're trying to impress them and trying to get them to come in and steak dinners, trying to get them on their side and trying to get them to donate, open up their wallets and support their calls. Kind of, kind of what it makes me think of. Okay. But again, we know from history that the king failed. Uh, history tells us that, that he and his father both attacked Greece and they both failed. And then later, uh, we see that Greece takes over the Median Persian Empire. We, under, we know that from history now. Uh, but it was a great lesson in that section on greed. Greed. Had he been happy with the 127 provinces, who knows how this would have turned out for him. You know what I mean? But he, but he wasn't. And there's, and there's much that can be said about this party. I didn't really emphasize the drinking in verse 8, and the drinking was according to the law, none did compel, for so the king had appointed all officers of the house. The law then was to drink as much as you could. Uh, they should do according to every man's pleasure. The king said, don't force them, but they can have whatever they want. You can drink whatever you want. Uh, some people today don't see any problem with drinking. They, they don't think there's anything wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with having a social drink. They call it social drinking. Just the fact they call it social ought to let you know there's something wrong with it. Amen. They didn't say scriptural drinking, they said social. <laughs> Amen. Right. There, there, there's nothing scriptural about social events. Amen. Most of the time. Uh, but let me give you something here. I want you to see this. Uh, I, I've not been running a lot of Bible references, but I do want to point out a couple in Proverbs. So turn to Proverbs 20. Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Mm. Chapter 21, verse 17. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. Wine. They're spending all their money on that. 
They spent all their money on that. There's been a lot of families had to do without because daddy or mama was an alcoholic. They spent all their money on that. All their money went to bars and, and uh, uh, moonshiners and such. Look at chapter 23. Chapter 23, verse 31. Well, let's go to verse 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babblings? Who hath wound without a cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Now we know that this wine is not new wine or grape juice. This is talking about fermented, when it moveth itself aright. This is talking about the fermentation process. This is talking about that. And that's what's going to turn your eyes red and make you babble and make you want to fight and cause many woes. Amen. Look at verse 32. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thy heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as him that lieth down in the midst of the sea. Oh, the room's spinning. Yeah. And, or as he that uh, lieth upon the top of the mast. How many of you ever heard old drunk talk about the room spinning? They have stricken me, shalt thou say. I got up, they get up and say, I feel like somebody beat me to death last night. And I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. They get up, and what's the first thing they do? They want more. Hire the dog, as they say. More hire the dog. But anyway... Wine is a mocker, strong drinks rage, and whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Best thing to do is not even mess with it. Don't even look upon it. I thank the Lord that I don't. I did at one time drink, but I thank the Lord that he took that away from me. Proverbs 31 Verse 4. This is good right here. This will take care of this drunken party. It is not for kings, old mule. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. And you can see this next verse talking about giving strong drink to them. That, uh, but anyway, we'll, we, I'll deal with wine at another time. But the best policy is not to even look upon it. Much less drink it. Amen. Number two in your outline, Roman numeral two, the problem. That's going to be verses 10, 11, and 12. Uh, and verse 10, on the seventh day when the heart of the king was married with wine, he commanded. Now his heart is merry, he's full of wine, and he commands that his wife, the queen, be brought forward. He tells seven of his seven of his servants, there in verse ten, to go and to go and uh, get her, to bring Vashti. Verse eleven, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look upon, but the but the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore, the king was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Now, first thing you notice is the demand. He wanted to show off his wealth, and he did. Now he's wanting to show off his wife. And there's a problem. Many have taken it to mean that when he said he wanted to show off her beauty, he meant for her to come in there naked. And that's, that, 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 there's highly probable that that was the case. And you say, well, that's just vulgar. That's just vulgar. Listen, you're saying that in a day and age where you can go in topless bars, where you can watch nudity on TV on demand, 
where you can have pornography on your cell phone, your computer, or anything else, and you think that's strange? No. It's not right. It's vulgar. You're right. Uh, but he wanted to show off her beauty. And uh, that could very well possibly be what they were talking about. Uh, but that was the demand. But notice her defying. She defied him. She said no. Now, to, to say no to your husband is bad enough. But to say no to the king is severe. She was risking her very life to say no to the king. To say no to the king. Now, there's no evidence that she was a believer. She was a pagan, just like her husband. But she knew the request wasn't right. Now, according to the Bible, your body, ma'am, is for your husband and for your husband only. And sir, your body is for your wife and for your wife only. That goes both ways. Uh, she stood for what she believed was right. She stood for and her character and principles, for her characters and principle, and and she's gonna pay the price for it. I wish that today's kids had that. I wish today's moms and dads had that kind of character and commitment, willing to stand for what they believed in, what was right, whether it cost them or not. Most people weigh the cost and they're not willing to sacrifice anything. Well, I'd do it, preacher, but I'd have to take time off work. Or I'd do it, I'd have to miss it. I'd do it, but, 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 but there's always a but. Not willing to sacrifice anything. She's willing to sacrifice her life here. So the demand, the defying, and in his disgust, he was angry. He was so angry, that was part of his problem. He, he, he was uh, very short-fused. He was a man of power, a man of privilege, and he was spoiled. He was used to getting what he wanted when he wanted, and when he, when he, when he issued a command, he was he was used to it taking place. So he was the typical man today. Amen. We used to get what we want when we want. When it don't happen, we get mad. We get upset, and that's what he was. He was mad. Uh, Oh my. The world, just like he, now, now, he takes counsel. We're going to look at that in a second. But the world gets disgusted when you stand for what's right. The world gets disgusted when we stand up for the truth or what's right. They get disgusted. They can't stand it. It's not what they want. It's not the way they want it. And they will take counsel and they will do everything in their power to silence you, to tear you down, and to replace you. Yes. Is that not what's going on in society today? Yes. As long as you're for them and praising homosexuality, abortion, and filth, as long as you're for what they believe in, you could be a movie star, you could be a rock star, you could be anything you want to be. But you be a movie star and you say something against homosexuality, you're out of the movies. You be a, a rock star or some other kind of star, they'll boycott you. They, they do everything they can to shut you down and silence you. That, that's this world. That's this world. Now let's look at the punishment. Now I will say this. Her wisdom, her character... And her stand is recorded for all eternity. They may try to silence you, but they can't. The truth will prevail. Truth is going to last forever. Amen. 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 So when you stand for the truth, you're standing on the right side. Amen. Even if you had to pay for it. But her wisdom, her character, her stand is recorded in the Word of God that abideth forever. That's awesome when you think about it. Number three. In your outline, the punishment. Now for time's sake, I'm going to have to move quickly. So this is just look. Let's start 
uh, in verse 13, the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew the law and judgment. Verse 15, what shall we do to the queen Vashti according to the law, because she hath performed this, uh, hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains? And Numitian answered before the king and the princess Vashti, the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in the providence of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. The king got mad and he turned to his wise men, which was the custom of the time. He was he was known for for allowing. Uh, he he was a he was a weak leader. He was he was a weak leader. Historians even prove that he was a weak leader because he depended too much. There's nothing wrong with having counsel, and there's safety in the multitude of counsel. I understand that, but. He, he depended too much on them. Rather than making a decision what he should do based on a man and his wife, they turned it into a king and the queen, and, and they began debating on what to do. He had turned to them and was asking them what to do, and they'd come up with a plan. They said, uh, but first they said, what the queen did hasn't just affected you, it's affected us all, because all our wives are over there to party with her. And they saw he, saw her say no to him. What are they going to do? They're going to be emboldened now, and none of our wives is going to listen to us. None of them going to listen to us because you can't control yours. That's basically what they said. Then they said, verse nineteen: If it please the king, let there be a royal command from him. Let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered. Once it was written and it was down, it could not be altered that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal state unto another that is better than she. Boy, it would be hard to find, will not it? Amen. And when the king's decree, which, was, uh, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all the empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husband honor, both to great and to small. See, when, they, when, when, the, what, when the women see what you do to her, they'll be afraid not to listen to us. When they see that we'll just put you away if you don't listen and we'll go get another one. Better than you, basically, is what they say. That's the message they were wanting to send. Now, of course, you know it pleased the king in verse 21. And in 22, he sent letters to all the providences and to every providence according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language that every man should bear rule in his own house. Now, that's New Testament doctrine right there. That's right. That's New Testament doctrine right yeah. there. That the man is to, to be the head of the home. But that doesn't mean he's to be a jerk. Right. That doesn't mean he's to be... Uh, well, I'll let that go. It should be published uh, according to the language of every people. So it goes out. First thing I want to point out in that section is the counselors. Uh, the counselors that he picked didn't tell him what he needed to hear. They told him what he wanted to hear. They said what they thought he wanted to hear. What a wise counselor would have said is, she's right. You're drunk. You shouldn't ask that of her. That's what should have happened. That's what should have happened. And, but, because he's full of pride, because he's so full of pride, they chose to tell him what he wanted to hear. Choose your counselors wisely. Make sure they're not just telling you what you want to hear, but rather telling you what you need to hear. Amen? Then the council. The council was kick her out and replace her. She's punished for doing right while he gets off without any problems. And I put number three, the cowards. The cowards. Uh, that's the counselors. They didn't want their women to cause them any problems. They was afraid of their wives. They was afraid that their wives was going to rebel against them 
if they didn't do something to the queen. See, they were more worried about their own selves than they were doing right, if that makes any sense. Then the command was issued in 19, and then the carrying out in verses 20 and 22. He followed the counsel of his wise men. Uh, but do remember, God is in this, and God is going to use this to save his people. God allowed this injustice to happen to one queen so he could make so he could raise up another queen who would be used to save his people just shortly down the road. So God's in control of it. Just because we go through troubles and trials and we may not understand, we just have to trust that God sees the big picture and he knows what he's doing. Amen. Even in the little things in life such as the wife getting mad at the husband and saying, I ain't doing it. You bet, what, come again? <laughs> I ain't following that old. I ain't, who are you? Yeah, no way I'm doing that. Amen. See, the Lord was more interested in that than he was in a war. That's amazing to me. That's just a sign, really. But anyway, any questions? It's, it's time. It's 47. All right. Let's dismiss the word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the simple, simple story, Lord, of everyday life. And I pray, Lord, that you just help us take it and apply it to our everyday life. Lord, help us learn and grow from it. And Father, we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.